this day. Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for this opportunity, God, to receive from you. We didn't gather by accident. We didn't gather unintentionally. We gathered with a purpose to glorify, magnify, and give all honor to you. And Lord, when praises go up, blessings come down. And I thank you, God, that you said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. God, Lord, there'll never be a growing, thriving ministry that doesn't lift up the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we lift you up in honor, glory, and praise, and power, God, Lord, you will draw all men unto you. And I thank you, God, Lord, that we're going to lift you up today. And we have been. And Lord, now you're going to share something into our hearts, our mind, our spirit, our soul to fuel us, to feed us. There's meat today. There's there's a full meal today, God, Lord, that you have for us. There's some leaders in here that are anorexic and Lord there are starved leaders and Lord my job isn't to fuel uh, just to give a meal that only a baby can take but Lord I'm I'm here to fuel some leaders today and I want to feed some leaders God through the unction of the Holy Spirit for what you have imparted into me so help me to serve the meal as you created and intended to be served I want to read a scripture to you John chapter 19, verse 25, it says this. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, Mary, and his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for three Marys that are going to change our life. Hail Mary. (laughs) And Lord, I pray that you would speak a word to us that would transform our life, that would catch us off guard. Lord, something that would go into the depths of who we are that might cultivate, might grow fruit and produce great life. I thank you, God, that your word is being made flesh, tangible and applicable to our life, that we might take it from here and do something with it. And Lord, I thank you, God, for what you're going to speak today. And I thank you for allowing me the honor and privilege to speak your word to your people. And I pray that you would anoint me to do so and accomplish the assignment for which you have me on. And Lord, to speak to your children as you would speak to them, not as Landon would. Remove Landon, let the Holy Spirit speak. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise one more time. I'm going to talk to you today about team culture. So before you're seated, I want you to give maybe three people a high five or a fist bump, whatever you're comfortable with, say, you're on my team. Go for it. I've got a lot of ground to cover, so if I'm preaching to the choir at different points and you get what I'm putting down, go ahead and give me a good amen. Uh, I want to greet all of our people who are streaming online, our overflow room that have people in there right now, and our prisons. Come on, Bridge Church, can you show some love? Uh, I'm in contact with our prison ministry. We'll be getting back soon, baby, so it'll be awesome. We'll be preaching in the prison ministry. I'm preaching to NAU uh, uh, football team on Friday, and so God, I feel like we're having church again. I feel like we're getting back into a rhythm, and we just had a serve day yesterday uh, with a ton of people who showed up to serve our community and, and really show up instead of just talking about being Christians acting like we're Christians. And so we got to do that and help Hope Crisis Pregnancy Center. And it was an awesome time. I want you to open your Bibles to John chapter 19, verse 25. I looked at this scripture and I thought, man, all right, Jesus, the Holy Spirit was like, I want you to turn here. I want you to look at this. And I was like, I was familiar with it, but I really wasn't ever settled or preached on this verse particularly. And I tried to remind God that it's not Easter. We shouldn't be preaching about the cross. I said, that's coming up Good Friday and Easter and later. Well, that's what we all preach about. Jesus, you're too soon. You're too early. And God was like, shut up, Landon. I want to teach you something. And so I, I started looking into this and then God started to reveal some culture that I didn't see before. You know, culture is all around us. It's whether we're aware enough to see it or not. And you carry culture everywhere you go. And this series that we're on, I'm going to be diving more and more into the depths of culture and especially kingdom culture and also including the subculture of bridge culture to kingdom culture. 
And so I want you to take good notes. I want you to follow along closely uh, because we take what God is saying seriously. So write it down, make it plain. But when you look at this uh, little picture here, you look at this passage of three Marys, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary of Cleophas, and Mary of Magdalene. And so you have these three Marys, and I, I literally... I, I was kind of like the flesh. So one side is like Jesus, you know, like this is too soon. The other side of me is my flesh side. Anybody have your flesh talk to you every once in a while? And I was like, Tupac, hail Mary, come with me. And I started singing this and God was like, bring it back to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And so I was like, so I had that. I've just tried. Some of y'all look at me and you're like, man, he has so much revelation. Like, I bet he just hears, thus saith the Lord. Here's the revelation. No, normally it's like Tupac first and then just like get you. <laughs> You little ADD boy, get back over here. Let's focus on what it is. And I'm just like you when I read scripture. I'm like, my mind is like all over the page. And so I'm reading this and I, I see three Marys at the cross. And it's confusing when you look at scripture because there are lots of Marys because they didn't have a lot of names to translate from, of course, uh, 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 to translate from, gosh, help me out here. Uh, into Greek and then into Latin. It was Greek, yeah, Greek into Latin and then into English. And so we, we didn't have a lot of, uh, they didn't have a lot, in Hebrew, they don't have a lot of dialect, especially like when you talk about sisters, they don't have another cousin, they don't have the word cousin. So it's, it, there's a lot of things that we have to help really look deeper into. So I'm going to go into this to show you a little bit deeper dive into this one scripture, unpack it, and show you how to have team culture. And there's four different components when it comes to having great team culture. I would say four different roles. So I want you to write down number one, two, three, and four as we talk about team culture. Because I've preached about team culture a lot. I was, many of you know, I was an athletic director, a coach. Uh, and then on top of that, played sports most of my life and loved it. It was fun. So I think team first. Uh, and that's my mentality. And I've been, I've been teaching about team mentality for a long time, how to build your dream team, how to cultivate a team. This time I'm going to talk to you about the roles of establishing culture in your team. And these four major roles will help establish it for your family. It will help establish it for your business. It will help establish it for your ministry. It will help establish in every area of your life. And you're going to see through these three Marys how it impacts your life. So when you look at these Marys, let me first paint a quick picture. The first Mary, we know pretty well, right? Mary, the mother of Jesus, right? Do, just nod your head if you actually, uh, uh, do I need to teach about Mary? <laughs> okay, so Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then we have uh, Mary of Cleophas, which is not a well-known lady. So this lady, sometimes she's described uh, as uh, the, the midwife. Uh, they don't really talk about her that much. It's really one of the only times that she's mentioned in the canon of scripture. And so when you see her name, it's kind of a, a for the first time, and we don't know a lot about it. Some people even say that they renamed her Salome. Some people say that this is really the mother of James and John because one passage says it's James and Jose that they this is the, the, the mother of. So it could be the J, James and John of Zebedee, right? And so they try to tie that in. And there's lots of discussion on who this Mary is. But I want you to write this down. She's in the middle. Somebody say, I'm in the middle. In the middle. Oh, you're going to find out today how much in the middle you are. But we, we're, she's in the middle. And so she's just the middle Mary. And I, we don't know a lot of details about her, but the Holy Spirit gave me something to teach. And then number three, you have Mary Magdalene or a Magdala. And so Magdala is a place and Mary Magdalene uh, uh, came from this, hailed from this place. She was the wealthiest in this place that was the, next to the Sea of Galilee. Those who are going to Israel with me, we have over 30 people signed up already for 2022, which is really cool. Uh, we only have 10 spots left, but let me just tell you this. Uh, I'm going to take them where Mary Magdalene is from. And you're going to see her house. I've been in her house. It's a three-story palatial building beautiful place. She was a wealthy woman. Somebody say sugar mama. Sugar mama. <laughs> she had, she was wealthy. She had tons of money. And so we're going to talk about her too. And we're going to show you that this, these three women plus John was there. John was next to the cross. And that's when this is the same passage that Jesus spoke to Mary and John and said, this is your mother. This is your son. And so that's the context of what we're reading from. So understand that in Jesus' darkest moment while he's on the cross, he's got these three plus John next to him. I want to ask you, who's not who's with you in the good times, but who's with you in the... Who's with you when it hits the fan? How about that? Who's, who's with you when life is not easy? Who's with you when... You, like, let's go a little bit further. Who's with you when you're dramatic? Who's with, who's with you when you're difficult to deal with? Who likes you when no one likes you? 
who, who is okay to be around? Because you got to have some people around you that say, even when you're bloody, even when you're spat on, even when you're in your worst, darkest, most difficult moment, and you've been cursed at, you've been abandoned, you've been left, nobody, everybody's cursing you and left. I, I'm going to be right here at your feet, and I'll be the one that we take you off the cross, and we wash your body, and we wrap you and prepare you. I'll be the one who's waiting by the tomb, saying, oh, they're going to come back to life. They're going to and because these were the first women to run and see Jesus come out of the tomb. They thought he was the gardener, but they were like, hey, listen, this is who. I, and and, and they're, they were there. Who do you have? I want your, this is team culture. Who do you have? I have some people around me that create team culture around me. I have people that we have on the front rows because we're going to establish our culture. You came into our way of worship. I got Omar in the front because he jumps around like a Mexican jumping bean. And he's just like, <laughs> and this dude's all over the place. Why? Because that's our culture. And we, we establish our culture. But we'll talk more about that in just a second. But we, we, have, we have to understand that you got to have some people around you who speak your culture. Everybody can be a part of your life. And this is extra. Everybody can be a part of your life and should be a part of your life. You should never burn bridges. What you get to determine is where they are in your life. So you will get to determine if you're a good steward, you will steward people's lives well if you decide that the closest people to me will get the most time from me. Because my love is unconditional, but my time is conditional. So I need to spend time with those who matter most because that's really the truth. And then you distance all the way to enemies because they're still in your life and you pray for them, but they're just not very close. As the old preacher said, just not in striking distance. You got to keep them a little further away so you don't get the spirit of slap on you and you don't, go, you don't get up to get saved again. You, you keep them at a distance so that you can have some layers. You need layers. Somebody say layers, baby. You got to have layers in your life. It helps you. It guards you. It protects you. Uh, but when we're talking about creating team culture, there are four specific types of roles that you need on a team. This is not an individual sport. Christianity... Church is not a one-man show. I'm going to say it again. This ain't tennis, sucker. This ain't golf. This is a team sport. It takes a team for an awesome band. It takes a team in a media team. It takes a team for ushers and greeters. It takes a team to grow the church. It takes a team to make life happen. If Jesus needed a team, you... Y'all going to help me preach at 945? You need a team, right? We need a team. We need that squad. We need that team. We need those, those, those people in our life, those roles in our life. Role number one, Mary, mother of Jesus. She was a culture, write it down, creator. She was a culture creator. She did it when she showed up and she was, had her little baby bump. And she walked over. She was pregnant. The angel of the Lord came to her. The Holy Spirit breathed life into her. And the first thing she did, first thing she did, check me if I'm in the Bible. How many know the Bible? She goes and she does what? She goes to her cousin's house. How many go to your family? You go, you have that favorite cousin. You have that favorite person. And you go and you're like, oh, I'm pregnant. And she went running pregnant. And she has her little baby bum. I'm trying to push it out more. It sticks out plenty. But she has, she has a little baby bum. And she's running over there. And then when she gets there, the baby leaps in Elizabeth's room. Enough so because let me, let me talk to the moms. If a baby was leaping all the time, one leap isn't noteworthy. But if all of a sudden something came near you, close enough to you that the baby left so much, you got to talk about it. There's something to note here. And then Mary not only did that, but that she also, she was the one who walked up, we talked about a few weeks ago, that said, Jesus, come over here, turn this water to wine. And she was the one who established and said, let's create some culture here. Let's establish your ministry. So she establishes, and we'll talk more about that, and we'll go back to that in a second. But when you're talking about creating culture, you need someone, you need to be someone in your life who creates culture. Write this down. You'll never do what you fail to define. You'll never accomplish what you fail to describe. You have to be able to articulate, this is who we are. Oh, 
right? My Young Life crowd filling up three rolls, right, Max? You got to define it. What's our goals? What's our, what, what, what are we trying to accomplish? Where are we going? Why are we doing this? Can we define it? Can it be easily spoken? What is our family mantra, culture? Healthy families don't just happen. Healthy cultures don't happen by accident. They are created. They are, are they, they, come on, where are my parents out there who are like, amen, brother. You don't just raise kids by accident. They turn out okay. You are very, you don't just get into a marriage. All my single people, amen. where are my single ladies at? We're, 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 you don't just get married by accident. You don't get into a relationship by accident. You go in with intentionality. When my, my wife and I, when we were going to date, I know me. That's the first thing you need to start with. I will mess it up. Right? How many? Come on. I, you, you, if you got the right, you'll mess the relate. You'll destroy it. What you need to be aware of is how can I make sure we get to the finish line? So you're saying, okay, if marriage and the wedding day is there, how can I not just jump all over or try to make out with her every five seconds? How can I try to handle this appropriately? So I was like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. I literally like would put her at a distance. And I was like, listen, I, I, I have a plan. I, I didn't communicate all the details of how terrible and untrustworthy I thought I was. But I did say like, hey, we got to space this out a little bit. So I said, every date I'm going to take you on is going to be on purpose. And it's going to be for a reason. So the first date I took her on, it was about holding hands. And I was like, okay, we're going to hold hands. And then I talked about holding hands means this. And I'm, I'm a preacher. So I'm like preaching like a message about holding hands. So I hold, hold hands. And then the next date, it was about hugging. And the next date, it was about kissing. And then the next day, it was about I love you. And then it was all, I, I was very intentional. Why? Because I didn't want to get to year 15 like we are and say, oh yeah, we still love each other. No, I want to be thriving in my, if I can't define it, I'll never accomplish it. But I want to get somewhere, so I have to shape that. So, so how you do that is you start, you go from goals to culture, culture to values. Values shape culture, culture shapes goals. I'll prove it to you. Um, when it comes to goals, it's shaped by your culture. How many in here are gym rats you like to work out? Raise your hand. Come on, shoot them up, shoot them up. Come on, come on, show you. Don't you're all being shy. Where's my big buff dude right back there? Yeah, raise your hand, man. You're a big old buff dude. And, and you like being in the gym. Where are my foodies at? Who just love food? Come on, raise your hand. Everybody with that back. Go ahead. I like food. Oh, me too. I love food. Every time I go into the gym, my buddies are trying to get me like super in shape. And I'm like, I don't want to be too ripped. Okay. And really, what I'm saying is, I like food, <laughs> and I like to eat, and I don't care that I'm a little pudgy. It's okay. That's, this is my life. And because your culture shapes your goals. So that's my culture, but it comes from my values. My values, why are my values like that? Because my values have to be shaped according to where I'm going. So I start back at values, and your values need to be easily described and easily communicated and definitely defined. If you do not define it, your family will end up in a place that you don't know how to lead them because you don't know where you are. I'm going to let that sink in. You need to be able to get to a place. I, I'm going to have a baby, right? It's going to be awesome. I'm not, wait, let me rephrase that. She's going to have it. We're going to have a baby. And I want to be intentional. So there are some things I say, Omar, now that I'm, some parents may be like, He'll learn. But some of the things I'm saying right now is no. I'm trying to shape a culture that my child, no matter what age they are, knows that God comes before my wife, my wife comes before my child, my child comes before everyone else, and I have a culture that shapes that, that says, no, no, baby, I love you, but it's time for a little mommy, daddy time. And we leave and we have time apart. Why? Because I'm going to shape my culture, you are being directed by the strongest thoughts in your mind right now. Your thoughts, the strongest thoughts you have right now, are the ones directing your entire life. I'm going to go up in your business. What are you thinking about? <laughs> What's on your mind the most? Why are you thinking about that the most? Why are you so... Why are you so angry about that why are you so passionate in love about that and why does it consume your thought because those thoughts 
will direct you that way. So be careful. So how do you establish this? You have to speak and define culture uh, and create it. Be a culture creator. For us as the church, I want you to go ahead and put it up. These are our values that shape our culture. When you came in here, you might have said, oh, I like the worship. It's really cool, energetic, love it. I like the greeters. They smile and they welcome you. I like the pastor. He's really bubbly and crazy and jumps a lot. I like this or I like that. It, feel, it felt like home. I walked in the lobby and it felt like, and I did this, and it was like and I got this and I felt like what you're saying is I like the culture I like the but the culture didn't just happen the culture came from values now look at these and realize how it impacted you I will this is speaking about me and it should be about you appreciate diversity God created the tapestry of this world he is not colorblind he loves color he loves diversity he loves change he he's not rich people in the front poor people in the back he's not hey everybody who looks like me walks like me talks like me he is appreciative he is the creator and we as his creation need to st- oh, I'm, uh, this is the Indian part of it I need to be a culture creator that says hey diversity is always welcome at Bridge Church this is who we are no no not by what we feel because everybody was cool when it was comfortable i've been preaching about racial diversity forever and equality i've never had anybody leave my church until last summer because i had people that i preached against racism and they thought it was just a cute thing from a little white boy preaching and building a church until racism became a real topic and a hot button place and then i had people telling me you're just race baiting and i said no 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 you have no idea this is who we are and i will speak value over everybody every chance i get because it's not about what you feel it's about who he is and what he's called us to do so my principles and my values values because it's easy to say your culture is one thing when everything's good your culture really is revealed when everything is not good their culture was revealed at the cross the disciples culture was revealed at the cross too when they were found nowhere so appreciate diversity i have four points i'm on point one practice generosity embrace the spirit fill. I'm going to preach this one this Wednesday night. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, you better come this Wednesday night. If you've never understood the Holy Spirit, if you've never understood the gifts and the fruit of the spirit, I'm going to teach you a lesson that will, tri- it'll transform your mind. So be here this Wednesday night. Lead with authenticity. Somebody said, amen. amen. Come on. Don't we need churches and Christians and people leading a little more authentically and integrous with character from now on? We have, we have several checkpoints of accountability in this church. Why? Because we're going to leave the same guy I am on Saturday at a bar with you. I'm the same guy on Sunday morning. I'm going to talk about Jesus there. I'm going to talk about Jesus here. I'm going to sit down and relax with you there. I'm going to relax with you here. Why? Because I'm not going to be two different people. And all of a sudden I get on the stage and I get my preaching voice on. And hallelujah. You come. I, I, don't, I don't talk like that. <laughs> I used to be so confused back in the day when I was a kid growing up in church, and I'd hear the preacher, oh, hallelujah, and he'd stomp around, then he'd come to me, hey, little guy, what are you doing? And I'm like, what happened to you, sir? (laughs) Lead authentically. Practice love and respect. We talked about that last week. If you weren't here, write this truth down because it'll change your life. Love, Love is balanced by truth. Respect is balanced by boundaries. Boundaries are good for you. Be the witness, because we're all called to be. Serve with purpose. Everybody likes to serve sometimes to make themselves look good. But the reason that we have serve with purpose in there is because a lot of people want to serve at the church. But what happens is when you serve at the church, you get burnt out. And you hate the church. And you don't like the pastor because he abused you and used you. And let me just tell you, you're good right where you are. Patient relationships are the best relationships, and there's no rush on this. And, and I want to do ministry with you for the rest of my life. So, but I want you to serve with purpose because if you know the why, the purpose, you'll always be filled. If you're serving for Jesus and not Landon, then you'll do great. Amen. So we have to describe these things, right? We have to define these things. And Mary was a culture creator. She literally walked up with that baby bump and didn't say a word. But when she walked up to Elizabeth, her cousin, who her husband, the Lord silenced his mouth and made him mute. Be careful if you're saying the wrong thing. God will find a way to your mouth. And so he's like, 
Close your mouth, young man. And then that way the women could talk. Some of, some of my women said amen. And, and then so the women started, and, they, and she comes over there with her little baby bump, and all of a sudden it lights, it leaps in her womb. Why is that so important? Because it's a light. Jesus was a life-giving culture before he ever broke the matrix. And when you got people around you, you need people who are creators of culture, who are life-giving culture, who when you get around them, you're like, oh, that's cool to be around them. I smile more when I'm around them. I leap more when I'm around them. I'm happier. How can, can people say that about you? Maybe you're thinking about somebody else, but do people get around you and leave? Oh, nice to meet you. This is great spending time with you. You know that one of my taglines, this is how you'll know if I ever want to depart from your presence uh, without being rude. I say, let us pray before I go. Because that's my way of immediately saying, let's get out of here. <laughs> but not offending you. It, and, and that's my nice, I found my way to create a boundary in my life that I will not have people in my life spending time in my life, not giving life to my life, not giving passion in my life, not giving peace in my life. Now, come on, somebody, if you believe me, if you just want it in your life, you should give God some praise. Because I want to get around Max, who's a life-giving culture. I want to around Jenny, who's a life, Omar, who's a life-giving. I want to be around that, and you should too. And then she did it with the water to wine. Do you have anybody in your life who can look at you and say, you've got greatness and you turn that and make a miracle into that. You got great. You can turn that business around. You can turn that family around. You can turn your marriage around. Who's the person that you have in your life? Can you become that person who is a culture creator? Who says, I know Flagstaff's only been known for this type of church, but kind of want to change it. I know no one will come at first, but I kind of want to change it. And three years ago, we decided to start a church, and we've doubled each year. (laughs) You name one company that doubles every year. Mm. Name one. God is doing something. That says, oh, when you're a culture creator, no, no, don't worry. You don't have to fight so much about when you're a culture creator, you're not worried about other cultures. You're establishing a dominion of kingdom culture saying we're a life giving culture. We're a loving culture. We're a kingdom culture. We're a peace filled culture. We're a happy culture. We're a smiling culture. We're a clapping culture. We're a happy culture. Come on, we can get excited because we're culture creators. Point number two. Second one. Because I got to be quick. The band's going to come and they're going to tell me I got to be done. Second one is that second Mary. Out of that squad that Jesus had right there. And he's looking down, bloody, beaten, worst moment, uh, naked. Can you imagine what he felt? And out of everybody who's left, the thousands. That he did miracles for. He's got three women and John. And then there's this one person that nobody knows about that's there. But yet, do you think, just perhaps, that this woman who's not really known is more important than you think? Because at some point in her life, she fought, followed, and, 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 and favored Jesus so much that she, she not only started the ministry, because some called her, remember, the midwife, probably midwife of Mary. And she started probably at the beginning, followed him all the way through the miracle signs and wonders when the crowd tried to kill him, followed him through the beatings, followed him through the tough times and the good times, followed him when the disciples were out there rowing on a boat. Did you know that the women were out rowing too somewhere and they were rowing across and while they struggled, the women got on the other side. Somebody praise God for some strong women because you know what? There's some women who said, you know what? I, I, I know where to go. I can get across. Man, those disciples were taking forever. And they were, they, one of the women, Mary Magdalene, was called the apostle of the apostles. But we don't, but, but the early in Christianity with the formation of the gospel, they tried to take these women out more of scripture because women can't do what men can do. But I see women doing what men cannot do. And I have men, I, we got women showing up. And everybody wants to preach about like the disciples and the 12 and then the three within the 12. And then that's how you form your team. But I want to talk about the people who were there when no one else was there. 
It's easy to preach about Peter when he was there for good times. So you, you, the second Mary is the middle one. Anybody a middle child? Go, yeah, come on, keep them up, you weirdos like me. Yeah, we're middle children, right? And what does middle children do? You got the older sibling. You got the younger sibling. Maybe multiple. And you're like, hey, take it easy. I'll fix them. <laughs> hey, take it easy. Stop crying. I'll fix them. And you're doing this the whole time. Come on, where are my middle children? You're like, and you older and younger siblings like, no, no. Yes. Middle children are the glue in a family. And they're like, hold it. One of my brother, when he was really little, my brother couldn't speak clearly. And it was cute because it was a lift, you know. And so he had the lift, he was talking like that. And so Stephen was younger, 16 months younger, but he, they couldn't understand him. But I was a little bit older, so I could speak and I could translate. So my, he'd be like, and then my, my parents were like, well, what did he say? Oh, he'd like a glass of water, a splash of apple juice in it, with a little bit of ice shaking, put on his <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just wants to, so I translate, you know, I translate for him. The, the middle children are connectors, and just like we need in our life culture connectors. Remember, she was called Salome as well. That was one of her names that they gave her. Did you know that Salome means peace? And while some people at a very elementary or rudimentary level think that peace is just a lack of war, violence, and yelling, but really the substantial definition of peace is to make whole. To, to bring together. If you can imagine the, the little dots that you used to have as a kid at the little placemat at a restaurant and you'd connect the dots and then all of a sudden you'd have this beautiful picture. That's what peacemakers are. Peacemakers are the ones who say, hey, let me go ahead and connect some dots here. The lost to the found, the hurting to the heal. Let me connect some dots. Because pe- that's why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Not because he's coming back to end war. He's going to start a war. And he's coming back to say, I will make whole what one was scattered. That's why the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall inherit the earth. Why? Because you're not out there saying, stop yelling. You're saying, let me make sense of this. Let me connect some dots. Let me bring some things together. I'm not in the spotlight, but I'm working behind the scenes to help somebody because peacemakers are more than people who just stop wars. Peacemakers, the greatest calling is to be a culture connector. When somebody's in that home over there and they ask you where you're you're going, you're saying, oh, I'm going to that house of fear. Why? Because I've got peace. Where, where, what house? I'm going to that house of hate because I've got love and I want to connect some dots. I don't care if you're going to the poor house, the white house, the jail house, until you bring his house into the equation. You've got no answer. Come on, give God some praise. If you understand what I'm preaching today. We are called and created to be culture connectors. And when and somebody comes in this church and say, I just don't connect. Oh, that's all right. Come here. Let me help you understand. Because at some point, somebody took your hand and said, let me guide you. Let me help you. Let me lead you. I got a lot of people who are like this. They're behind the scenes. In fact, their servants, their volunteers are sitting around you right now. They're up here on this platform. They're back there. I have 50 eight employees that I'm in charge of. Some of you are like, that's a lot of people for this church. You don't know what goes on behind the scenes. There's a bigger picture than you think. 58. In fact, if you serve at this church at any capacity or at any point, serve your city, anything like that, stand right now. Come on, give them some hand. Give them a hand. Give them a clap. Stand, stand, stand. Yep, in the back. Go ahead. There, there, here. Great job. You may be seated. We have right under 200 volunteers at our little church. Cute, huh? I think it's okay. My goal is not getting above the standard. I hear you, Holy Spirit. My goal is to create a new culture that says churches only have this much, and I just want to go a tick above that. No, no, no. Everybody should be involved. This is a team sport. This is a team mentality. We all pull weight together and we all change the world together. Many hands make light work and you can go farther together than you can alone. And if we do this together, God can change the world, but he needs some culture connectors. (sighs) 52, how much time do I have? I'm gonna finish here. And I'm going to go further in third service if you want to stay. But I, 
The third one is Mary Magdalene. It's really interesting. I want you to write this down. She is a culture changer. First of all, women shouldn't be leaders, and she became the apostle of the apostles. Second of all, she was extremely wealthy. She's one of the most controversial women in the Bible, and I'll tell you why. Because she was so influential. And because she was wealthy, one of the popes in the early Christian days, about 560 A.D., or 566, don't, don't write me a letter if I got that number wrong. But she got around that, around that time frame, you're talking at the early Christian church, uh, 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 made her into a prostitute so that they could, they could vilify why she was wealthy. <laughs> and they could, they could then also discredit her from ever doing it, but also give her credit. And, and, and that's where we don't, you, we got it. She was a culture changer. She says, no, I'm wealthy because I made my wealth. No, I'm a leader because I was born to be a leader. No, I'm changed because Jesus touched my life. No, I'm the woman. I'm the person God created me to be. And I'm going to change the culture you think it should be. And I'm going to make it into kingdom culture. And when everybody leaves, I'll be the one at the altar. I'll be the one clapping. I'll be the one cheering. I'll be the one when no one else wants to stand for Jesus. I'll be the one. Oh, somebody shout it. I'll be the one. Shout it again. Come on, shout it again. I'll be the one. I'll be the one that's an agitator. Right? Oh, get in there with a big loving smile. That's more creepy. But I, I'll get in there and I'll be a culture changer in my work. Do they know when you come into the workplace to change their conversation because you're a believer? Or does the conversation stay the same because no one knows what culture you're a part of? Because we're called to be a culture agitator. Oh, they say I'm not supposed to say that? Okay, here we go. Someone wants to tell me, oh, I can't pray for that? Oh, yeah, here we go. Some, and I'm telling you, I get this all the time. Preacher, don't talk about Biden. Don't talk about Trump. Don't talk about race. Don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. I said, oh, damn the devil and the horse he rode in on. I'm going to speak to you what God tells me to, and I'm not subject to you and what you want me to preach. I'm going to preach what the Holy Spirit tells me to preach because I'm a culture changer. I'm going to break your culture. I'm going to infect your culture. I'm going I'm to agitate your culture. I might piss you off and poke some buttons in you. Why? Because Jesus did it and I need to do it. No, it's not an excuse for abuse. But yes, it is a reason for you to step out and be who you're called to be. And I'm not here to go. On. That's why but I don't allow a lot of people to sit in the front row, in the front two rows especially. Because I only want my ameners and real worshipers up front. Got real quiet. Not for real. Because your culture is not mine. I'm a, I'm a white male, middle age. That means nothing when it comes into this house. My culture of my Irish and English roots mean nothing when I come in here. I, I drop my culture for his culture. I change my culture for him. did God bring you here then change your culture the reason you're having a hard time changing someone else's mind about Jesus is because you haven't changed your culture in your own heart and when you change your culture you'll change your life D dare yourself to learn something new dare yourself to learn a new trick Right? That's what they say. Old dogs can't learn new tricks. I think that's a lie. Don't you believe it? I think it's a lie. And I'm not old yet, but I'm looking ahead at my years, and I'm like, I haven't peaked, and I'm not even close to that. And when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old, I don't want to be able to sit there and say, and listen, because I'll be one day, I'll be sitting in a chair listening to some other guy preach, because when my days are done, I'm going to empower somebody else to take over the church. And when I do that, I'll be sitting there listening to somebody, and I don't want to sit there and say, well, that's not how I preached. That's not how I did it. You know, oh, back yet. And we're, we're, uh, no, I want to be like, oh, okay, this is how we're doing. Okay, we're changing. All right, we got a smoke machine. Oh, we got lights now. We got, oh, okay, all right, here we go. You want to do it like that because why? Because you have to have somebody in your life that will help challenge 
the culture to change the culture. I got to end. Um, I'm going to continue this more a little bit, hopefully in next service, but definitely in the next week or two. But I want you to connect with your team. I want you to get the right people around you. Who have you identified and are you some of those characteristics of those roles of a culture creator? Do you have people in your life that are trying to take culture from you? You're trying to worship and follow and love Jesus and they're just mocking it. Are they closer than they should be? You need to decide who's, who should be right here. Because this is, this is who it really comes down to. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. Oh, I thank you that you spoke and not Landon. I thank you that that wisdom is far beyond me. And I thank you that your revelation is beyond me. But that's the sign of the Holy Spirit working. And many today, online, in-house, in a prison cell, streaming in Montana, Florida, California. God, wherever they're tuning in from, God, Lord, you spoke to them because it's your word and your children who are called by your name. And I thank you that your word says that it shall go forth and never return void. But it's going on the good ground and it's going to grow a great harvest and Lord we thank you God that we're going to start getting into a team culture mentality oh yeah no more just me and one or just me alone no more solo missions no more no more just by myself no more just thinking for myself I want the right team around me and I, and I pray that somebody wants to become the right team member for somebody else Lord, I pray that you'd speak to somebody right now who wants to be on your team and say, you know what? I want to give my life to Jesus today. I heard your word and man, I've been running. I gave my life to God when I was a little kid, but it's been so long. I need to rededicate my life. I want to be a part of the team. If that's you here and online with nobody looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's you, I want you to shoot your hand up right now. Shoot your hand up. Come on, come on. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Keep them up. Keep them up. Thank you for that hand. 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 Lord, in Jesus' name, online and in-house, keep them up. Keep your heart open and ready. Thank you for that hand. God, you're going to do something great in somebody. Thank you for that hand. For every hand raised and heart open right now is your chance to receive Jesus into your life and eternity. If that's you with your hand raised and heart open, oh, we're going to repeat a prayer together. So I want everybody under the sound of my voice to repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord, as my Savior, as my Heavenly Father. I'm forever yours, and I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God some praise. Give God some praise. Come on, let's give him a real praise. Amen, amen, amen. Stand to your feet. The Bible says, for those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be. And if you gave your life to Jesus today, we are so proud of you. Come on, can we give a hand for everybody who gave their life to Jesus? Okay, remember when I said you'll never accomplish what you don't define? I want you to know our goal this year is 4,000 saved. Last year, we were only at 1,000. I, I want to get, I want to see 4,000 this year. God, give us a bigger building. Can you imagine if all, if I don't have to, because we're going to have to go to four services soon and Easter, five services. They're all the, like, you, I'm thinking ahead and I'm like, God, we just need a bigger property, bigger building. That'd be great to worship together. And, 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 and I, I could see hands. That's what I see when I see a bigger building. I see hands raised. I see people in a back row of a, of a balcony worshiping who had never worshiped before, but they looked down and they saw hundreds worshiping Jesus. So they said, maybe I'll do it too. And, and I see this because I see God doing something great. And let me just tell you, make no small plans here. God is a big God, a great God, and you need to dream big. It's an insult to God with safe living and small thinking. You cannot think that way. Not as a believer. You don't have the privilege anymore. You have to dream bigger. Amen? 
What a great Sunday. Amen. As I mentioned, I'm preaching this Wednesday. I'm preaching Monday. Monday night's going to be powerful. We're going to put lots of chairs in overflow and in, in the lobby and all that good stuff. But make sure you're here for that because that's just going to be an incredible time. I got a word just for leaders. And so if you consider yourself a leader somewhere else then I, I and, and you want to be a part of this house, number one, you, you serve wherever you're a part of. But number two, you make sure that you're here because I want to pour a leadership word into your life. It's about Joseph, and I'm going to preach something about Joseph you've never heard before. It's going to be incredible. Monday night, Wednesday night, and then next Sunday. Let's speak this bridge declaration and be dismissed. I am a bridge builder. This is my season of favor. Come on. I am blessed to live my best. I will choose to love him first. I will worship fully, love deeply, and my community will thrive because I am praying for it. I am a carrier of peace. I will represent God's gentleness to myself and others. I will live out his gospel. I am blessed to live my best because I am a bridge builder. Amen. God bless you. We are so glad that you joined us today. If you made a spiritual decision today, whether that be dedicating your life to Christ for the first time or rededicating your life to Christ, email us at info at wearebridge.church and let us know you made that spiritual decision. Also, if you are joining our Bridge Church online family for the very first time, we have a special gift for you. Email us at info at wearebridge.church to share some information so we can get that gift out to you. We're so happy that you joined us today and we can't wait to see you soon. Make sure to stay connected because we are so much better together.